Luke 24 and verse 1. This is what we read. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their heads to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene. Johanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Let me set the scene for you. And the scene is one of grief. On Friday, we saw Jesus crucified. We saw an innocent man die a shameful death. We saw him die and saw him buried. And you can imagine how the disciples were feeling, right? They had followed this Jesus. They were expecting him to redeem Israel. Only a week prior, he had ridden into Jerusalem with such triumph. On a donkey surrounded by people crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then Friday comes. And Jesus is hanging on a cross with the title above his head, This is the King of the Jews. And you can imagine that Saturday, that Sabbath, as the disciples and and as, as was custom for the Jews, they rested on the Saturday, on that Sabbath. And you can imagine the grief that would have overcome them. And it is in this, I imagine this place of grief that the women... Now make their way to the tomb, fully expecting to find the body of Jesus. And yet, that is exactly what they will not find. Because Jesus is alive. This is what we read. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, They and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now notice, it's not the apostles who are the first ones to go to the tomb. It's it's the women. The first opportunity that they get to honor the Jesus and the body of Jesus, they, they take it. Now, they couldn't have done it before this point because of the Sabbath. But such is their love, such is their devotion to Jesus, that the first chance they get, they make their way to the tomb. And from the other gospel accounts, it actually sounds like they haven't even figured out how they're going to get the stone to be rolled away. And yet they're just going. They're like, we want to honor Jesus But to their complete shock and their complete horror, they find three things. They find the stone is rolled away, the tomb is empty, and the body of Jesus is nowhere to be found. 
Now, forgetting what we know now, because perhaps you've heard of this account, perhaps you're a Christian and you've heard of this account, or perhaps you're not a Christian, and yet you still kind of know a rough idea of what kind of this, this whole thing is about. Forget what you know for a second and put yourselves in the shoes of these women. Imagine turning up to the graveside of someone you love and finding that which they see. Uh, my grandparents on my dad's side, uh, they are both uh, buried uh, in a cemetery near where uh, my parents live. So near where I used to grow up, uh, about a 15-minute walk away. And occasionally, um, I think I've, finished, I've, fin- I've visited the graveside maybe a couple of times since they passed away over the years. And now if I were to turn up, say if I was to go tomorrow, and I was to turn up to the, the graveside of my grandparents. And imagine if I was to find one of the caskets dug up, left open, and the body missing. I would be, as anybody else would be, in complete shock. Different theories would be swirling around my head, trying to explain the sight in front of me. And naturally, this is where the women are, and they're thinking to themselves, what, what is going on? What has happened? Where's Jesus? And it is into this space of confusion, this space of fear and anxiety, it is into this space that God sends a messenger to speak. You see, what can account for the stone being rolled away? What can account for the empty tomb? What can account for the missing body? The answer is this. Jesus is alive. And it happened. As they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. I love the angels questioning here. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Right, this, this, in essence, they're like, hey, this isn't the place to be looking for Jesus. Why? Because you're not going to find him here because he's alive. Now, if we were to think of how many figures in history... How many figures throughout history, whether that be religious leaders or political leaders or people uh, that, uh, that have been influential in history, think about how many of those grave sides, if we were to turn up to, we would expect to see a body and guess what? We would find one. Uh, recently, I was walking uh, back from church one morning after setting up and I was approached by this woman and she was lost. Uh, and she was clearly a tourist, and she kind of approached me, and, and her English wasn't great, but after several attempts, kind of, we, we kind of finally figured out that I realized she was basically asking for help to find the house um, of Karl Marx, who actually, turns out, I didn't know this until she came up with her map, and I was like, what's going on? Apparently, he actually lived, used to live opposite uh, where me and Lois live. And I imagine as part of her tour, she most likely would have gone to his tomb, which is in Highgate Cemetery. And if you went there, what you would find is the tomb isn't open, the tomb is closed of Karl's marks, and inside you would find his remains. As much as this lady admired and followed this man, Karl Marx, he is dead. Like every other religious leader, every other political figure that has come before, they are dead, except one, Jesus. There is only one who has conquered the grave. There is only one who is alive right now. There is only one who has overcome the greatest enemy of all, that being death and sin, and that is Jesus. Only one person in history is called the resurrection and the life, and that is Jesus. I want us to see, if you were to, as I say, if you were to make a lineup of all the religious uh, figures and political figures throughout history, and you were to ask who could step forward and claim 
that they are alive and risen from the dead and only Jesus can step forward. Because there is none like this Jesus. Only he is the resurrection and the life. Uh, Not long before this point, and we read this in in John's Gospel in in chapter 11, we read of this account while... um, We read of this um, event when Jesus is on his way to the graveside of his friend Lazarus. And while Jesus is on his way to the graveside of his friends, he says this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus, on that occasion with the events of Lazarus, he declares of himself that he is the resurrection and the life. And guess what? Now he proves it by himself resurrecting and coming back to life. Now imagine, if Jesus had said, I'm the resurrection and the life, and then he dies, but he stays dead... Or so much for his claims. If he stayed dead, well, you can't be the resurrection and the life, Jesus, because you're dead. But if Jesus came back to life, he proved that declaration and so many more that he said. In that song uh, by Phil Wickham, I love how, uh, it's called Living Hope. I love how he describes this moment. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared, the grave has no claim on me because Jesus, yours, is the victory. Can you imagine that moment In the tomb, Jesus' body, which has been absolutely torn to shreds. It has nails imprinted. His back has been whipped and scourged. Marks where the crown would have been implanted in his head. Bruises where he had been hit by the soldiers. His body would have been such a mess. He was dead. Can you imagine that moment when suddenly breath comes back into his lungs? This is good news. Jesus coming back to life because it means we can trust the promise that he gives us. Remember that that promise. Let me read it again. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Right? We can trust that promise that Jesus made and many others because he rose from the dead. Jesus promised that those who believe in him will experience their own resurrection to life. That though they die, they will live. It is a a resurrection, a rising again to an everlasting life. Whoever lives and believes in Jesus, he says, will never die. And we can trust this because Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. The angels continue. They say this, he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. If you read through the four gospel accounts, you're going to see multiple occasions. Jesus specifically and in great detail tells his disciples before the cross that he was going to be crucified and rise again. He told them multiple times. And yet, despite Jesus telling them, they just, they just didn't seem to get it at the time. And so here the angel speaking to the women, he's like, remember. Remember what Jesus said. Remember what he said. Because he has already explained to you the events that you are watching before you. Jesus told you that all of this would happen. 
He told you he would die. He told you he would rise again. This was God's plan all along. And this was God's plan to redeem us. And we'll talk about that a bit later on. This was God's plan to save you and to save me. And so the angel's like, remember, this is what Jesus has been saying all along. Uh, I, uh, I grew up in a, in a Christian home, and I think about how many times I heard the gospel. How many times I heard the good news of Jesus, and yet it didn't click straight away. Like week after week, my parents brought me and my brothers with them to church, and I'm so grateful they did. And we used to, you know, I would, I would sit in services and, and go to Sunday school, and we'd have like family devotions at home, and, and this was a church that preached the gospel. And so I grew up hearing this good news, and yet deep down, I was spiritually blind to that gospel until one moment it finally clicked. And I imagine for, some, for many of us, it's a similar story, right? The truth was shared multiple times, and then it came that moment where we believed. A bit like how these disciples were told repeatedly, by Jesus, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again. But it just didn't click. And in the case of these faithful women, it doesn't begin to click until they see this empty tomb and they see the angel saying, remember, remember. And their eyes, bit by bit, are now beginning to be open to the truth. In verse 8 it says, and they remembered his words. And so how do the women respond? They then returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Johanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. These ladies, they in some ways become the first evangelists, right? Because they then go and start spreading the news to the apostles. They're like, hey guys, the tomb's empty. The body's gone. And an angel has told us that Jesus is alive. But notice how these first hearers, these apostles, who themselves had walked with Jesus, notice how they themselves struggled to accept the claims says this and their words seem to them like idle tales and they did not believe them when the apostles originally heard the reports of the resurrection they responded in unbelief they saw the reports as idle tales A question I have for you this morning is, how will you respond to the claims of the resurrection? If I was to go through Camden Market this afternoon, and I imagine it would be absolutely buzzing because it's a Sunday, it's a bank holiday weekend, the sun's out, it'd be busy, packed. And imagine if I was to go down to Camden Market and started to ask people, random people, hey, do you think the events of the resurrection really happened? I imagine a lot of people would say, No. And if I ask why they believe that, it would be interesting to see the different responses. Why do you believe this didn't happen? But perhaps they would say something along the lines of, this is impossible. Dead people don't come back to life. How can I believe that? I mean, this just doesn't happen. This just sounds like an idle tale. The word uh, in the Greek for idle tale is uh, leros, which means an incredible story or a, a, a twaddle, which is perhaps not a word we generally use. I had to Google it. So a twaddle is this, a trivial or foolish speech or writing nonsense. <laughs> these apostles are hearing these accounts and they're like, these are just, this is, this is nonsense. This is an incredible story, but surely this is just exactly that, a story, a tale. And what's interesting, isn't it, right? 2,000 years removed, that is the same response as many. 
The same initial response of these apostles who heard these reports on the very day the resurrection took place, and yet they themselves are like, no, no, this can't be true. This is, surely, this is an idle tale. I want us to realize that even the first hearers of the resurrection, they struggled to hear it just as much as we did. Uh, I love how Tim Keller says it in his book, Reason for God. He says this, I sympathize with the person who says, so what if I can't think of an alternate explanation? The resurrection just couldn't happen. Let's not forget, however, that first century people felt exactly the same way. They found the resurrection just as inconceivable as you do. The only way anyone embraced the resurrection back then was by letting the evidence challenge and change their worldview, their view of what was possible. They, they had just as much trouble with the claims of the resurrection as you, yet the evidence, both of the eyewitness accounts and the changed lives of Christ's followers was overwhelming. I want us to realize it was just as hard for them to believe as it is for us to believe. But when they were presented with the evidence, they could not deny it. Now, if you continue reading on in Luke's gospel, you will see that Jesus himself multiple times will appear to these apostles. Jesus will confirm the reports of the women. He will show up and be like, Disciples, I'm alive. Feel my side. See the nail imprints in my hands. This is real. I'm alive. This is not a hallucination. You're not dreaming. This isn't a lie. This is true. And now go and tell the world about this truth. Do you think that all of this, all that I've just read, do you think it's just an idle tale? Is that how you view the events of the resurrection? Well, I want to challenge and invite you to really inspect the evidence. Granted, these disciples will actually get to see this risen Jesus multiple times. But I want to challenge you. We have really good reasons to believe the testimony of these eyewitnesses, of these people who didn't just see an empty tomb but we later to see Jesus in the flesh alive again. We have reason to believe these eyewitness accounts. And let me just give you a few reasons why we, we can trust these accounts. Number one, the first eyewitnesses being women points to the authenticity of these accounts. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, number one, if you were making this up, if this was all a lie, Right? If you were like sat down, like, you know what, we want to propagate a lie that Jesus is alive, you would not have women as your eyewitnesses. You would not have women as your first eyewitnesses. Why? Because back in that time, 2,000 years ago, the testimony of, a women in, of women at that time in that culture, it amounted to nothing. It did not amount to anything. And therefore, if you're going to fabricate a lie, you, you don't put women as the, as, the, as the first eyewitnesses. No, who do you put? You put the apostles. You put them as the heroes. But guess what? They're not written in a very valuable light here, right? Because they disbelieve at first. They're not the first ones to the tomb. But rather, it's the women. The fact that, that they are the first eyewitnesses points to this not being a fabrication, the fact that Jesus being buried in Jerusalem. Think about this for a second, right? At the day of Pentecost, the disciples go into Jerusalem and they proclaim that Jesus is alive. He is risen from the dead in Jerusalem. If anybody wanted to cross-reference whether that is actually true, what do they do? They just go to the tomb. The tomb in the very same city, a tomb which was owned by a man who had public reputation. This wasn't like Jesus was buried in secret somewhere nobody could get to. No. And if they showed up to the tomb, what would they find? The stone rolled away, an empty tomb, and the body missing. And not only that, these disciples, they died proclaiming that Jesus was alive. You have to ask the question, why would these disciples die for a lie? 
If this was all a fabrication, if Jesus was still dead, number one, all they had to do, people, all people would have to do is present a body, and that, that means it. That's it. You completely get rid. It's like, hey, want to prove this is a lie? Simple. Just pr- provide the body. But they couldn't because the body was missing because Jesus was alive. And not only that, as I said, these disciples, they spent their life proclaiming, we've seen Jesus, he's alive. We've seen Jesus, he is alive. And they didn't gain riches and fortune by proclaiming that message. Do you know what they gained from proclaiming that message? Suffering, persecution, and ultimately death. Why would the disciples die for a lie? Or could it be that the reason that they died was because it was true? I want to challenge you. If this is all a made-up tale, if this didn't happen, then there, honestly, there is, no list, there is no reason to listen to anything that Christianity has to offer. It is a waste of time. You need to understand that this being a real event is foundational to the Christian faith. Without it, Christianity is useless. Ignore it. Jesus and the Christian faith, it stands or it falls on whether Jesus really rose again or not. I love how the Apostle Paul says it. He says it this way in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14. And if Christ is not risen then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of all men the most pitiable. If this is just a nice fairy tale, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, what we are doing right now, this preaching is empty. A preacher preacher standing up to give a sermon from the word of God. It's empty. It's vain. If Jesus is dead, our faith is empty. It's futile. And the accounts that we are reading, well, they are just simply lies and they are simply misrepresenting God. If this is not true, well, we as Christians, we have nothing really. We have no off. We know we have no hope really to offer. For the believers who came before us or even for ourselves about life after death. And as Paul says, you should feel sorry for the believer. You should feel sorry for the Christian because our lives of following Jesus is wasted if he didn't rise again. And it also means this. The deepest problem of all has not been dealt with. Our sin. If Jesus did not rise again, the deepest problem of all, sin, has not been solved. But I have good news for you. Because Jesus did rise again. In Matthew's Gospel, we read of this moment um, where um, when Mary becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit and, and an angel visits Joseph. And the angel says to Joseph, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take, you, take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins we need a savior we need to be saved from sin this is the greatest problem that all of us have it is sin the reason for such brokenness in and around us ultimately 
when you trace it back, it ultimately traces back to this issue of sin. Us as individuals and also us as collective humanity turning our back on God. Us saying to God, God, I make a better God than you. No, God, I will not acknowledge you as God. I want to be God. As John Stott says, for the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God. Sin is me wanting to be God. And as a result, I do wrong against God, I do wrong against other people, I do wrong against myself. And God, being a just God, there's a punishment to be paid for that. But listen to this, John Stock continues, For the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Isn't this crazy, right? In our sin and in our rebellion, we said, God, I want to be God. And yet in salvation, Jesus says, I'm going to take your place. You deserve to be on that cross, but instead I'm going to go to that cross for you. All the wrong things you've done are going to be placed on me, and I'm going to take the punishment on your behalf. John Stock continues, man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. We deserve to be on that cross. That should have been us. And yet instead, Jesus takes our place. Jesus bears the full wrath of God the judgment that we deserved. He took our place, Jesus in our place. But he didn't stay dead. How do we know that Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient? How do we know that Jesus' death on our behalf accomplished what it set out to do? The reason we know is because he came back to life. I'm here to tell you today that the resurrection did happen. Jesus is alive, and as a result, you can be saved from sin and death. You can be saved from the penalty of sin. As I say, we've all done wrong things. We're deserving of judgment, and yet Jesus takes that judgment upon himself. So therefore, you don't have to pay the penalty because he's paid it for you. He saves you from the penalty of sin. He saves you from the power of sin. Just as Jesus rose again to new life, if you trust in him, he breathes new life into you. He gives you his Holy Spirit and now enables you in your day-to-day life to say no to sin and to say yes to him. Where once sin completely overwhelmed you, now by Jesus you can live a life that pleases him. And now he also gives us the promise that one day we will be completely removed from the very presence of sin. And we know that to be true because Jesus himself rose again and therefore we have a resurrection ourselves to look forward to where we rise again with him to everlasting life where there is no more pain, there's no more sorrow, where sin and its effects are completely gone, where he wipes away every tear and we experience life everlasting in his presence. And this is all because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And this gift is one which we freely receive. You cannot earn this gift. You cannot earn this gift of salvation. But rather, if you repent, if you turn away from your sin and trust in Jesus, you experience forgiveness of sin, salvation from sin, an everlasting life with him. Jesus is alive and that changes everything. They believe these things to be idle tales, but then that wrong belief changed to fully believing that the events before them were real. 
May that take place in each and every one of us if that has not already. May we move from this place of seeing the resurrection as an idle tale to seeing it for what it truly is, real historical truth. Jesus is alive and as a result, we have hope and salvation. Our text ends with this, Peter. But Peter arose and he ran to the tomb and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. Peter goes, he sees the empty tomb. He sees the missing body of Jesus and he's beginning to put the pieces together. And as we see later on in this chapter and in the other gospel accounts, we'll see that Jesus himself will come face to face multiple times with his disciples saying, do you know why the tomb was empty? Do you know why my body was missing? Because I'm alive. And it reminds us that the tomb, the stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out, but to let us in. Uh, Kathy Keller says this, To my surprise, I realized the stone needed to be rolled away not to let Jesus out, but to let us in. Trust, but verify. The resurrection needed to be verified by eyewitnesses who could testify to the empty tomb and empty clothes, as is a faith founded on an event that occurred in space, time, and history. And it began with an angel politely opening the tomb so we could look into the empty space and see he was no longer there. I pray today that you and I, we would both look at the empty tomb, that we would both look at the eyewitness account and that we would truly believe for ourselves that Jesus is alive and that through faith in him, we experience salvation. Uh, let me pray uh, and then um, Jaden's going to lead us uh, in communion. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you that the events that we read of today, these is not an idle tale, but it is truth, a real event. And because of that, we have hope. We have salvation, the forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ. And I pray for each one of us, Lord, if we believe this, if we've accepted you as our Savior Jesus, and I pray that this would just bolster our joy, that we would once again rejoice at the good news that you're alive, and that we would share that good news with others. And Lord, if any of us are here today and we just see this as an idle tale, I pray that we would move from a place of unbelief to a place of faith, that we would move from believing this is just an idle tale to believing that this is true life. Lord Jesus, thank you for rolling away the stone and inviting us to look in and see the truth that you are alive, and in you and you alone, there is salvation, reconciliation with God, and everlasting life. All because you died and you rose again, Lord Jesus. Amen.